Welcome back to Bombastic Nation and Ting and Ting and Ting. I'm Mr. Giant and I'm back with some more vibes for all you. Yes, I and another suggested video that I watched because I watched something about the difference between American police and British police. So somebody said, watch this one here because uh, the whole thing about guns and gun laws came into play with that there. This one is called How One Mass Shooting Changed the UK's Gun Laws Forever. So, you know, let's see what they did because it seems like there's a lot of mass shootings going on all of a sudden here. You know what I mean? I think there was like three or so in the last couple of weeks here. So let's see how they dealt with it because it doesn't seem like they have that issue there. Let's YouTube and Sim Simmer. Hundreds of students ran for their lives. We didn't think this would ever happen. A shooting at an elementary school in Newtown, Virginia Tech. Parkland. Columbine High School. A total of 15 people. 33 dead. 20 children, 7 adults. More than 240,000 U.S. students have experienced gun violence at school since Columbine in 1999. But in the UK, it's a different story. Private ownership of all handguns and semi-automatic rifles is banned, a concept unimaginable in America. But how have these two inextricably linked nations ended up with such vastly different attitudes on guns? And how did this massive change in the UK even happen? To understand, we have to go back to 1996, when the Dunblane Massacre changed everything. Grief, shock and disbelief in the Scottish town of Dunblane. A former scout leader with a grudge. It is a tragedy without precedent. Sixteen tiny children died right here at Dunblane Primary School. The massacre, carried out by a man who had licenses for his guns, was enough to change the UK's gun laws forever. What's truly amazing is that by the end of the next year, it became illegal to own a handgun in the UK. But how did the UK get to that point so fast? It was mainly due to the activism from those personally affected by the attack. My daughter Sophie was one of the 16 young children who were shot dead at Dunblane Primary School. She and I were on our own. She was my only child. Dr. Mick North was an academic before the shooting, but after, he found it impossible to return to that life. So he devoted himself to making sure other parents never had to experience his agony by becoming a gun control activist. Hi. Hi. One of my initial reactions after Dunblane was a feeling that this should never have happened because the guns that the perpetrator used have been too easy to come by. Dr North combined forces with other people who were touched by Dunblane, like former Scottish Labour MP Richard Simpson. Now he was a doctor at the local hospital at the time, but then after that experience, he changed his entire career, became a Labour MP, and helped to lead the motion to change the gun laws in the UK. That's so you make change. What I discovered was that the then Conservative government was in the process of actually uh, seeking to deregulate the process by which guns were regulated in the United Kingdom, and that really made me very annoyed. These two men were part of a movement fighting to be heard by politicians. Residents of Dunblane and relatives of victims started speaking out and organising public relations campaigns and creating petitions. Politicians weren't necessarily used to hearing from the victims of shooting incidents. Everyone who says, I enjoy the sport, I want to hold the gun in my hand and have the live ammunition, what I say is, you have those emotions for enjoying your sport, but feel the emotions of a parent who is never going to see their child again. It was a really a massive groundswell, a bit like the uh, climate extinction movement now. It wasn't highly coordinated um, or paid for. So we had a petition called the Snowdrop Petition, which was getting the public to sign up. See, uh, me and guns just don't mix, you know what I mean? I've seen close up what guns can do just don't mix i mean i mean i mean this happened like what two days ago there was a gentleman there's a gentleman that comes in and he usually i work at a grocery store he usually have his gun on his waist you know what i mean and then the other day i was walking out and i was looking in the opposite direction and i bump into him but he didn't have his gun he had it concealed and i could feel him you know just hit the hit the gun and man i'm thinking you're in a grocery store you come to buy food. 
Nine times out of ten, nobody's going to mess with you there. I don't know your temperament. And to think about it, if you want to walk around with a gun exposed like that, I don't trust your temperament. Because if you look at history, when you had the Wild West, people just shooting up people. Granted, the laws weren't as uh, stringent then as it is now, but still, look at all the mass shootings. People walking around with guns. You know, I saw another incident in the parking lot just about two months ago where, uh, and the person with the gun, it didn't even involve them. It didn't even involve them. Okay, one guy pulled out of a parking spot, almost hit another guy. They started arguing. The guy who pulled out left because a woman and her husband started yelling at the guy who was yelling at the other guy that, that pulled out of the parking lot. And, well, the woman started yelling first. And the next thing you know, her husband come out from around the car with his hand on his, his pistol like this. It's like the Wild West out there. You know what I mean? Nothing happened, but still, it just takes one little thing and they shoot him. Because it's human nature, you know, you, you pull that gun out, man. It's just like, I don't see the point, you know? So everybody want to have guns. I, I just don't understand it. But most of the people who want to have the guns aren't people who have had to see how guns have been used or seen the effects after how guns or gun has been used or have ever had to use a gun. I talk to this lady all the time at work and she's always like, shoot, kill, shoot, kill, you know what I mean? I, I even said, talked about that in one of my videos before. I think it's the one that compared uh, American and British policemen. And uh, somebody commented and they said, well, which house do you live in if you know you don't want to have guns though you're going to just listen listen here's my philosophy if somebody break into my house yeah let's say i have a gun i'm not shooting to kill i'm shooting to wound because i'm not going to have death on my hands i'm not going to have blood on my hands you know what i mean and if i can if i can't do that i'm gonna find a way to escape and get out of there you know what i'm saying whatever they take could be replaced my life can be replaced that person's life can be replaced and I have, a, I have a weird way of looking at stuff if somebody break in your home people think that a whole lot of the times it's just greed that making people break into the homes but a lot of the times it's just desperation I'm not saying greed is not a, 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 a part in it but a lot of it is desperation they don't have any money you know what I mean so if instead of paying attention to arming people to defend themselves how about fixing the way the system is the way things are so the people who would do that would have something you know what i mean pumping up education because education has gone to the dogs here I, i'm going to straight up say that and i'm not just saying that people around me you know what i mean i'm listening to them so when you when you try to better the society then more than likely people ain't gonna be more apt to do that because there's opportunities because where i live there's not a whole lot of opportunities there's a lot of drug use and yeah it's quite possible you're getting robbed by drug people but if you don't fix that then that's good. the whole gun thing is going to be prevalent you know what i'm saying and i don't understand the mass shootings i'm going to be the first to tell you that i do not understand the mass shootings and stuff like that so i'm not even going to speak on that but let's continue watching this So we had a petition called the Snowdrop Petition, which was getting the public to sign up for a ban on handguns, eventually gaining over 700,000 signatures. Within two years, a total ban on handguns had been introduced in this country. By 1999, over 165,000 guns and over 700 tonnes of ammo had been surrendered. There was a lot of opposition to it, and it was suggested that it would actually badly affect people who use guns for sport, but it hasn't done so. What we do is a going major to. achievement, and I'm, I'm very satisfied with what we were able to do. Dumb blame happened. The gun laws were overhauled before Columbine even happened, two years earlier. It's like the precedent was set. We knew what was starting to happen across the world. 
and two years later, on April 20th, 1999, two teenagers shot and killed 12 fellow students and a teacher at Columbine High School near Denver, Colorado. Just like Dunblane did in the UK, Columbine shocked Americans. It wasn't the first school shooting in the US, but those images captured on live TV set something off that had ripple effects throughout the country. And just like in Dunblane, no one was closer to the situation than the victim's parents. I'm the father of Daniel Mauser. He was one of the students killed at Columbine High School. He was 15 years old. Like Mick North before him, Tom devoted his life to fighting for gun control, even taking a year off from work to lobby at the state capitol. Just two weeks before Columbine, at the dinner table, Daniel asked me a question based on something, a conversation that he had with other members of the debate team. He said, Dad, did you know there were loopholes in the Brady Bill? Brady Bill is a national law that requires background checks for purchase of didn't know. And I just kind of blew it off. He was then killed with a gun that was purchased through a loophole in the Brady Bill. I mean, how could I not act on that? I mean, that was very prophetic. And it made me realize that when we have loopholes like that, when we have so much carnage in this country, we have to do something about it. I became very uh, vocal, active. And Tom did make some very real progress on a state level soon after, helping to introduce a bill to close the same gun show loophole he and Daniel had discussed over dinner. In 2000, the public voted and passed Colorado's answer to the Brady Bill by an overwhelming majority of about 70%. I felt that I did something to honor Daniel. I did something in response to something he brought up to me. But this small victory at the state level in Colorado was overshadowed by strong national backlash against gun safety laws. Barely a year after Columbine, then NRA President Charlton Heston gave this famous threat. From my cold, dead hands. In America, uh, we are so wrapped up in individualism and rights that we say, well, no, we can't do that because that might possibly affect my rights. And for a lot of people, that's more important than what could possibly happen to them or their neighbors. It's a cultural issue that is very starkly different between us and other nations. I, I think it's shameful in the, in the U.S. that we have failed to really react in any, any significant way. Since Columbine, the narrative in the U.S. around gun rights and gun control has only become more polarizing. Restricting law-abiding Americans from acquiring guns is obviously unconstitutional. Is it time to repeal the Second Amendment? The left has their rigid, radical, anti-gun agenda. Hell yes, we're going to take your AR-15, your AK-47. In the U.S., barely any federal gun control laws have passed since Columbine. In fact, experts say the most significant change in gun law is when politicians let a Clinton-era assault weapons ban expire in 2004, making assault weapons like AR-15s legal again. Since then, the AR-15 has been used in almost every notable mass shooting in America. And the problem continues to get worse. The US has more firearms per person than any other country in the world. And it's the only country in the world that has more guns than people. And the US gun homicide rate is 25 times that of other high-income countries, including the UK. The main problem is not necessarily the Second Amendment, but how that has been interpreted. In America, there needs to be an understanding of how to tighten the law without grossly infringing on what are perceived of as rights under the Second Amendment. But it does seem ridiculous to use the words of the Founding Fathers to decide how you control or don't control weapons that are usually used in war zones. There have been so many mass shootings since Columbine that many Americans feel hopeless about reform. The fact remains, however, that 61% of Americans do support stricter gun laws. And there are many potential changes, such as closing the gun show loophole or restricting assault weapons that would make a huge impact and would not go as far as a total ban on firearms. It takes a long time sometimes it's not just changing the laws. You also have to change culture to get people to be willing to change the laws. And perhaps there'll come a time when enough people 
and vote in politicians who will be supportive of the gun control measures that America needs and deserves. No one has kids so they can buy them bulletproof backpacks. You have kids so that they can hopefully thrive in a better world than you did. We really have to ask ourselves if we're giving them that opportunity. Okay, I did this video, but I ain't gonna argue. I ain't arguing with nobody about, you know, gun this and gun that. Drop some solutions. Drop some solutions. The argument ain't getting nowhere, so, you know, I'm not gonna be in the comment section arguing with nobody. I know people are gonna say, well, you give your opinion and you don't wanna hear my opinion. People are dying. That's my opinion. What are we going to do? Stop it. Drop some solutions. You know what I mean? Uh, people always can, uh, uh, accuse me of being liberal, which I'm not. And I'm not conservative neither. So why am I arguing with you if you don't have any solutions? Solution is the key as far as I'm concerned. Yep, call it an opinion, but when there's death, death is not an opinion. It's a real thing. Death is not an opinion. Solutions. I ain't arguing. Because I see people arguing on my Facebook page all the time. And nobody's got a solution. Drop some solutions in the comment section. On either side, it doesn't matter. What do you think should be done? Not calling each other names and carrying on and all of that. You know what I mean? One child die in a school because of a gun shooting, that's one too many. That's one too many. Let's pay attention to stopping the dying instead of arguing without a solution. That is not an opinion. Listen, you guys take care of each other, okay? Cool runnings.